Have you ever had this experience? You meet up with someone that you haven't seen in years, and they say something to this effect. What happened to you? <laughs> Hopefully they just mean they haven't seen you in a while. And then maybe you moved off or something, but you know, you might you might get offended by that. If they're sort of talking about your looks, you know. Hopefully they weren't that rude. Hopefully they uh, toned it down a little bit and made it clear that the ravages of time didn't have that much of an effect on your on your looks. But you know, maybe they said something like Wow, you've changed. <laughs> or, I didn't recognize you. You know, that's, that, that takes a little bit of the backhand out and a little bit more compliment, even though I think there's still a little backhand in there, isn't there? <laughs> but, you know, you come across people that you haven't seen in a while, and, and you figure out things change. They've changed physically, you've changed physically, but other things in life have changed as well. You know, and, and you never know how things have changed. And so you, you ask this person that you haven't seen in such a long time, uh, you know, how's your job? And, and Oh, you're in between jobs. Okay. Uh, how's your wife? Oh, you're in between wives. Okay. Uh, yeah. You have any kids? Oh, of course, they're with your ex-wife. Okay. I think I'll just stop talking now you know, foot and mouth disease. So, but you never know how things have changed. You think about people that you knew in high school, and they're not like that anymore, are they? Now, there's some people that they never seem to change. They look the same now as they did 30 years ago. You know, I hate these people. You know, they just look perfect. These beautiful people, you know, just can't stand the people like that. Or maybe they're not, they, maybe they weren't that beautiful in the first place, but they look the same, you know. But, but the, most of us, we change physically and we change in our circumstances. And, and the reality is we change spiritually, too, over time. I mean, someone that you, you once knew was very involved in church. Well, now they don't go to church anymore. And maybe you looked up to somebody because... They really loved the Lord back then. Well, now they, they don't love the Lord much anymore. Hardly have any memories of them, to be honest. You know anyone like that? Are you anyone like that? Now listen, I, I want you to know that this place right here, it's a safe place. Okay? And I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about when God's people gather, when, when we gather together. It's meant to be a, a safe place. I'm talking about all the people here, myself included. It ought to be a safe place. We want to be a sanctuary in every sense of the word. A true sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe place. A sanctuary, the very word sanctuary means it's a holy place. It's a different kind of place. It's different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world might beat you up, but God's people should not beat you up. And so a true sanctuary, when God's people gather, should be a holy place dedicated to the God of the second chance, to the God of the third chance and the hundredth chance. And there's some of us that need a second or third or a hundredth chance, and we serve a God who can relate to us, who loves us. And so when we come together as a church, we are the sanctuary of God where people can be healed, where people can be real, where people can be loved. And so if I'm talking about you having this formerly close relationship to God that has somehow drifted away and now it's, it's much more distant, it's a distant memory at best, or maybe if I'm talking about you because you, you've never had any kind of good relationship with God. You wouldn't, know, you wouldn't even know what a relationship with God looks like. That's okay here. That's okay here. Okay? Because we're not the kind of church that's going to beat people up for being less than perfect. The last time I looked at all of you, you're less than perfect. And the last time I looked in the mirror, I've got the same problem. I'm less than perfect. And so as a church, we're going to do two things. 
We're going to do our best to uphold God's perfect standards. And we're also going to do our best to extend God's endless mercy. We're all in need of God's mercy. And so I hope that you'll find some encouragement in this truth today, that if you, even if you're far away from God, you're not the first. You are not the first person to ever drift away from God. There are people today, and there were people in the days when the Bible was being written, whose connection with God became broken. And we read about some of these people in a verse in the Old Testament, in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1. We read, All Israel was registered in the genealogies that are written in the book of the kings of Israel, but Judah was exiled to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. Now, I don't want to come down too hard on anyone today, but I want you to understand something that I have to be truthful. We have to be truthful with ourselves. A doctor who is not truthful about his diagnosis cannot prescribe a cure. A restaurant manager who is not truthful with himself about his restaurant's problems cannot fix them. A coach who is not truthful about his team's weaknesses cannot address them. And a preacher who's not truthful with you about why you've drifted far from God cannot lead you back. Judah was exiled to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. What happened to Judah way back then can happen to us today. Now, who in the world was Judah? What was Judah? I'll tell you. Judah was at one time a tribe within the Jewish people of Israel, who were chosen by God to be his own nation, his own possession. And they, Israel, were to teach the other nations of the earth about Yahweh, the, the Most High God. They were to show the other nations how to live. They were to show the other nations how to be blessed by Yahweh. And by the time of, of this verse that we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1, where they were exiled to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness, by that time, Judah, this tribe, had seceded from the northern tribes of Israel due to some major disputes over taxation and other things like that. And, and by the way, that's what happens when political opponents see each other as the enemy instead of everyone working toward the same goals. But because of Israel, really because of Judah at this point, because of their unfaithfulness, they went from being the chosen people of God to being captives in a foreign land. That's what it means when they were exiled. They were taken captive. How did this happen? The same way it happens to us today. They started living like neighboring countries. They lived like the people who were unbelievers, who did not believe in Yahweh. And before long, you couldn't tell the difference between the people who said they believed in Yahweh and those that worshiped Baal and whatever other god might be out there. And you might say, ah, oh, well, so, you know, so what? Is that really that bad? I mean, what, what does that really matter? Well, here's why it matters. God relates to people through covenants. He relates to people through covenants. Israel had a covenant with God that was supposed to distinguish them from other nations. They were to worship a different God than the other nations. They were to live a different life than the other nations. But after a while, you sort of see the way your neighbors are living, and that looks pretty good, and... It won't be so bad if I just incorporate some of their practices into my life. And, and Israel broke their covenant with God. Here's what Israel started doing. Israel started worshiping the false gods of their neighbors. God calls that idolatry. And he doesn't like it. They began to see the 
the, to, to seek out the favor of the false gods, to give them good crops, to give them health and safety. Now, how do they seek out the good favor of these false gods? Well, if this false god over here is the god of fertility, I know what we'll do, they said. Let's participate in acts of fertility during our worship services in order to please that god so the rains might fall on our crops. And they engaged in ritual prostitution. God wasn't too keen on that idea either. And then Israel went so far as to offer their children as human sacrifices to these false gods. And as you might imagine, these types of practices, idolatry, ritual prostitution, child sacrifice, were violations of God's covenant with Israel. And when you break a covenant, there are always consequences. There are always consequences. Now, let's talk about this idea of a covenant. And you see some, some tools here b- beside me. I want to see if I can find something that might represent a covenant. Over here, you got a saw. This is a pretty good idea of a covenant, but this is a different sermon because in the Old Testament, literally, when a covenant was made, it said that God cut a covenant. But they usually meant cutting an animal. We're not going to do that today. Over here, you've got a hard hat. And I'm just going to guess that it will not fit my ginormous head. So, no, it will not. But very, very inconspicuously planted, there happens to be a piece of paper. This is... A covenant. You know what a covenant is? It's a contract. That's what a covenant is. Now, that doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? And you might even say to me, well, I, th- I thought contracts were just legal documents, but, but covenants were like spiritual agreements. Well, that's the way we've come to think of it in America. In fact, Our distinction between covenants and contracts has actually become part of the American English vocabulary. But if you go back to old English, I mean the Queen's English and not the current Queen, way back when, that old, 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 old Queen's English. You go back to that old Queen's English, the word covenant and contract, they meant the exact same thing. Well, not anymore, not in America at least. Now in American English, here's what a covenant means. A covenant in American English is an agreement that may or may not have penalties attached to it if it is breached. And so in America, when you enter into a covenant, it's really just a matter of uh, keeping it because you're an honorable person. That's it. Keeping a covenant in America is simply a matter of of honor, nothing more. But in America, if if you were to break a contract, ooh, there's penalties there. And usually the penalties are all spelled out in the contract if you break them, right? Well, listen, the American way of understanding covenant is not how the Bible understands covenant. And we do a great disservice by reading our wrong understanding of what a covenant is back into the Bible. And here's how it happens. You'll have a well-intentioned preacher say, marriage, and I don't know why he talks like this, but he does. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a covenant. And he has a little scowl right there. I don't know. Anyway, and I get what he means. He means that marriage is not just a piece of paper that anyone can just sort of tear up and it's all over. That's what he means. And he means this, that marriage is spiritual. Marriage is ethereal. Look that one up. Marriage is heavenly. But here's the problem. If marriage is a covenant only by American standards, then keeping your marriage is only a matter of honor. Why do you stay married? Because I'm a decent person. That's it. 
And because we have this, this wrong, limited understanding of what a covenant is, we think that a covenant is simply a spiritual, ethereal, heavenly agreement that you're supposed to keep because you're an honorable person, and if you don't, well, there's no big consequences, so what's the, what's the deal? Who cares? Well, no wonder we have such a poor view of marriage in our country. We preachers don't even teach Christians what their marriage covenant really is. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, you'll discover that there is one word which means covenant or contract, just the same word, and it's the Hebrew word berit. It's the only Hebrew I'll teach you today. It's the Hebrew word berit. In Genesis 31, Jacob is dealing with his father-in-law, Laban. And Jacob's father-in-law was a sneaky dude. you got to keep your eye on this guy because he'll trick you. And so they set up, in Genesis 31, a legal, physical boundary between their two lands. And the agreement was called a berit, a covenant, a contract, same thing. If either side violated the berit, they would suffer the consequences of not having peace. Why? Because berits have consequences. Covenants have consequences. In 1 Kings 5, you have a guy by the name of King Hiram of Tyre, of the nation of Tyre. And he met up with the brand new king of Israel. This brand new king was a guy by the name of Solomon. We've heard of him. And so they set up an agreement where Hiram, way up north in Tyre, would give wood to Solomon, and Solomon, in exchange, would pay Hiram. And this is what we read in 1 Kings 5, 12. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. There was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. What's a treaty? It's a contract. It's a covenant. You can probably guess what Hebrew word is used for the word treaty. Berit. They made a berit. What is a treaty? It is a berit. If Hiram didn't deliver the wood, Solomon doesn't pay. Why? Because berits, covenants, have consequences. Always. A, and a properly understood marriage covenant likewise has consequences to it. In ancient Judaism... In those marriages back then, there would, there would exist a long marriage contract, a long marriage berit, and it delineated exactly how much money both sides, the groom and the bride, would bring into the marriage. Everything was spelled out. How many cattle are coming in? Whose businesses are coming in? Everything was spelled out in the contract. The berit would even delineate roles in marriage. We have ancient documents that say, say things like this. The woman will do the cooking and the man will provide the food. The roles were all spelled out. And so in this berit, each side had obligations and each side received benefits. You see, your marriage and our, mar our marriages today are not supposed to be only a spiritual promise that you keep only because you're an honorable person. Marriage, the berit for a marriage, is supposed to be a legal contract as well with teeth that bite if you break it. Marriage is a berit. Now, this is not a sermon about marriage. The point I'm trying to make is about covenants. In the Bible... A covenant is an agreement between two people with stipulations and usually with penalties. That's what a covenant is. And God relates to humans always through covenants. Well spelled out covenants with stipulations and with penalties give you a few examples. Remember Noah, the great flood, the big boat? When Noah got off his big boat after the great flood, when the water subsided, this is what God said to Noah in Genesis 9. Understand that I am establishing my covenant with you 
and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. God made a covenant with Abram, with, with Noah, and then a few chapters later with Abram. In Genesis 17, when Abraham was, uh, and Abram, I should say, was 99 years old, this is what God said. As for me, here is my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And to you and your future offspring, I will give land. Very important, especially by the time you get to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1. I will give land for your residing, all the land of Canaan, as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. Later, after God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt... This is what God said in Exodus 19. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples. Although the whole earth is mine and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. All throughout Israel's history, God related to them through a series of unfolding covenants. But there's a problem with covenants. What if one of the parties is untrustworthy? When God made his covenants with Israel, he was the only trustworthy partner in the deal. And guess what? We're just like Israel. We're not trustworthy. We're unfaithful to the covenant. And that is why you may have been close to God at one point, but now he's far away. One of you has broken the covenant. And it's not God. When you break a covenant... There are always consequences. You see, all throughout your life, your spirituality can be characterized by e either by seeking after God or forsaking God at all times. You're either seeking after God or you are forsaking God. Here's what seeking after God looks like. Your faith is alive. You yearn for God's word. You obey God's word. You, you clean out the idols that try to creep into our heart and try to displace God. And, and when you seek after God, you know in your heart that you're on the right path. God is present and you know it. His spirit confirms your seeking after God. But when your life is directed toward forsaking God, it looks like this. It looks like apostasy. It looks like falling away. It looks like idolatry. Other things, other things than God, become the focus of your life. You begin to ignore God's Word, even despise God's Word. You begin to avoid church because you don't want to be confronted with God's Word. And I think that's one of the real dangers coming out of this pandemic is that so many Christians have gotten so accustomed to not going to church, they have drifted from God and they resist the idea of going back to church because they know they might be confronted with the Word of God and it's easier to stay in a state of falling away. When you're forsaking God, there's a lack of prayer. When you forsake God, pride builds up in your heart instead of humility. 
God does not want you to forsake Him. God does not want you to continue to break His covenant. And so, God is going to do what it takes to get you back. For the people of Judah, what would it take for them to come back? Jeremiah described what God was going to do to them this way. This is Jeremiah speaking to the people of Judah. He says, For 23 years the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. The Lord announced, Turn, each of you, from your evil way of life and from your evil deeds. Live in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors long ago and forever. Do not follow other gods to serve them and to bow in worship to them, and do not anger me by the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. But you have not obeyed me. This is the Lord's declaration. With the result that you have angered me by the work of your hands and brought disaster on yourselves. Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says. And why is he called the Lord of armies? Because there's a big old army that's about to come and get them all. This is what the Lord of armies says. Because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the families of the north. This is the Lord's declaration. And send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And I will bring them against this land, against its residents, and against all these surrounding nations. And I will completely destroy them and make them an example of horror and scorn and ruins forever. I will eliminate the sound of joy and gladness from them, the voice of the groom and the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land will become a desolate ruin. Ruin and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. You see, when you break a covenant, there are consequences always. And God will do whatever it takes to bring you back. Author Paul Tripp rightly observes God's toolbox, the tools that He can use. To accomplish his purpose includes everything. He is unshakably sovereign. God can use whoever he will to do whatever he wills. Whenever he wills it for the sake of his people and the sound of his glory. And if God wants to raise up Babylon to send his people into exile for 70 years because of their unfaithfulness, he can do it. And if God wants to raise up circumstances in your life to send you into spiritual exile because of your unfaithfulness, he can do that too. God is a lot less concerned about your wealth and your comfort and all the pleasures of your life than he is your heart being devoted to him. If you find yourself today in a state of spiritual exile, I want you to know there is good news. It does not have to last forever. There is hope. There is grace. You just need to return to the Lord. This is what Jeremiah says a few chapters later. For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me 
with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. Christian, listen. Has God forgotten you? No. Has God abandoned you? No. Has God tossed you aside? No. Has God been trying to get your attention? Absolutely. Absolutely. Today is the day to return to the Lord. Today you can begin to rebuild your life and repair your spirit. Will you respond to his call today?